Good evening and welcome to ITV News Meridian. Tonight's headlines. Over the limit, a hovercraft pilot pleads guilty to being under the influence while on duty in the Solent. On the right lines, the head of the South's biggest rail franchise tries to persuade commuters things are looking up, but are they? Don't suffer the way we have. A couple who lost their baby to meningitis warn others to watch out for the danger signs. And getting the message, we reveal the mysterious contents of not just one, but three bottles washed up on our coast. Good evening. A hovercraft pilot has admitted being nearly three times over the drink drive limit while in charge of a vessel crossing the Solent. Richard Pease was at the controls during the journey from Portsmouth to Ryde, but a colleague had to step in and take over when the 50-year-old fell ill. 36 people were on board the hovercraft. Pease later failed a breath test and today he admitted his guilt in court. Andrew Pate has our report. An experienced hovercraft pilot who had an unblemished record. Richard Pease has almost 20 years' experience behind the controls of this powerful vessel. But during the journey from Portsmouth to Ryde on June the 22nd, he fell ill and a colleague had to take over. Tests showed Richard Pease had 96 micrograms of alcohol in 100 millilitres of breath. The legal drink drive limit is 35 micrograms. It meant the pilot from Cowes was three times over the limit. There were 36 passengers on board at the time, but thankfully Mr Peace's colleague safely landed the hovercraft. In a statement, the company told us, Hover Travel has reviewed their robust procedures and concluded they were implemented successfully on the day, which ensured that any risk to health and safety was mitigated. Regular training and a clear understanding of our safety procedures gave our crew the confidence to react appropriately to the situation. It's the fastest way to cross the Solent with a journey time of less than 10 minutes and 26 million passengers have used the service since it started in 1965. Hover Travel say they can't comment on the specifics of this case while the proceedings are still ongoing. Richard Pease was released on unconditional bail. He will return to the Isle of Wight Crown Court on October the 10th for sentencing. Andrew Pate, ITV News, Portsmouth. Remember that story and the rest of the day's news can be found on our New Look website. On your smartphone or tablet, scan the code on the screen now to be taken straight there. Or on your computer, just search for ITV Meridian. In other news, more than 200,000 passengers used Southampton Airport last month. That's 3% more than the same period last year and the highest number in any one month since August 2007. The route with the largest growth was Guernsey, with passenger figures up by more than a half. Brighton Hove Albion fans are the best behaved in the championship, according to new home office figures. Five fans were arrested at games last season, with just three banned from matches. Of the arrests, two were made for public disorder, one for missile throwing, one was an alcohol-related offence, and the other for damaging property. Meanwhile, Portsmouth has lost out on its bid to become the new UK city of football to Nottingham. The city was shortlisted from 22 bids for its commitment to increasing involvement in the beautiful game at grassroots level. The winner receives £1.5 million of national lottery funding for a two-year pilot programme. More trains, better punctuality and improved stations. Those are just some of the promises made by the company operating new rail services in the south. First Capital Connect, Southern, Gatwick Express and Great Northern will now be run by one firm after it was awarded a seven-year franchise. But union leaders and commuters have their doubts, as Tom Savides reports. The boss of the country's biggest rail franchise arrives at Platform 2 at Blackfriars Station to launch his company's new services. Within moments, angry passengers from our region are telling him what they think. Packed 
late carriages, late running or cancelled trains and overpriced tickets, just some of the many gripes passengers have about rail services. Late as always, <laughs> always delayed, always never on time. It's very cramped and for what we pay for our fares, it's just not right. So will things ever change for frustrated commuters? Well, the chief executive of the newly set up Govia Thameslink Railway seems to think so. Some things inevitably will take a little bit of time to deliver, perhaps a couple of years, two or three years before we get the new trains in. But some things are changing immediately. So you'll see the, the new names, um, Thameslink and Great Northern, uh, straight away. And also uh, some of the information improvements. So our, our staff will have tab modern tablet technology to allow them to give better information to passengers. Govia Thameslink Railway has just been awarded a seven-year franchise to run services through parts of Kent, Surrey, Sussex and Hampshire in the south to Bedford and Cambridge to the north of London. The company is promising new trains, more carriages and station improvements. Today's announcement is part of ongoing plans to improve services across four major rail networks, but those improvements won't happen immediately. They will be phased in over a four-year period. The rebranding of trains is already underway, but passengers won't just be satisfied with a lick of fresh paint. They will be expecting real improvements to services. Tom Savidas, ITV News, Blackfriars Station. Well, now, young people voting for the very first time could have a profound effect on the result of the referendum in Scotland on Thursday. Unlike a general election, even 16-year-olds can take part in the ballot. Well, at one school in Sussex, youngsters have been staging their own referendum. They say the vote on independence will have a profound effect both sides of the border. Malcolm Shaw has our report. As a union, we are better able to tackle issues of inequality and social injustice. Youngsters of this age will have a powerful voice in the historic vote on Scottish independence. Today at Brighton College, six formers staged their own referendum to explore the issues the ballot raises. On Thursday, north of the border, 16 and 17 year olds like these will be casting their votes for real, shaping the future of everyone in or out of the United Kingdom. One of my concerns is that this is just salmon trying to get a few more people in favour. Whereas Scottish, the sick votes at 16 and 17 should be taken as a very serious issue and it's something that needs to be considered nationwide. I was actually born in Edinburgh and so I feel I have friends there who are allowed to vote and I feel it's quite unjust towards me for, to just not have a say as it's a piece of my heritage, definitely. Both the yes and no campaigns need to win over young voters. Surveys suggest the issue of tuition fees is the one which most concerns them, followed by the economy, currency and welfare. Concerns shared by their peers here, hundreds of miles south. I think um, we've seen here that they are engaged with politics generally, but also that they are passionate about the future of the union and it, and it really concerns them uh, what happens on Thursday. In the words of Alex Salmond, yes we can. After a lively debate, the students headed for the polling booths to cast their votes and the result, an overwhelming 87% against Scotland becoming independent. If Scotland can still now get the benefits of, of, of more freedom but still have the strength of being with England and keeping this union. We've grown up with a sense of being British and the sense of being pride in Britain. Like in the Olympics, it's Team GB. We've grown up being British, not English, Scottish or Welsh. While Alex Salmond is unlikely to be much troubled by a no vote from students at an English private school, the views of Scottish young people could be crucial in deciding if his dream of independence becomes a reality. Malcolm Shaw, ITV News, Brighton. You're watching ITV News here in the Meridian region. Coming up, is there no end to the Indian summer? Simon will let us know. Plus... When an Englishman's home is a little more comfortable than a castle and could be in for a top award as well. For more on all of our stories, you can head to our website, itv.com forward slash news forward slash Meridian. Why not give us a call on 0808 1010 095 or get in touch via Facebook or send us a tweet at ITV Meridian.
family whose baby son died from meningitis at just 22 days old are warning other parents to watch out for the danger signs they didn't spot. Caroline and Adrian Grove say they are supporting Meningitis Awareness Week so that everyone knows the symptoms and how to seek help fast. Natalie Gray reports. Caroline and Adrian Grove with their children Megan, Toby and Archie. But this family of five should be a family of six. But little Caden died at just 22 days old in 2008. He was born prematurely and was in a neonatal unit when he contracted meningitis and septicemia. He was really cold to touch, he was really pale, but he, he'd had trouble with his temperature before, so we just, we just thought he was a bit cold. Um, and then when I gave him his feed, he was a bit sick. He was like panting a bit like a dog and just making a funny noise with his breathing. And about six o'clock in the morning, they came and knocked on the door and said, um, would you like Caden christened? And we sort of went, uh, uh, yes, we do. So the um, chaplain came and, and christened him, and it was it was dreadful, really. They said that he was really ill at that point. I think that was the first time that we realised that that um, you know there might be a chance that he might not sort of recover. He was rushed to a specialist hospital, but nothing could be done to save him. He was showing signs of brain damage. Um, he was on ventilator. He was making no effort to breathe for himself. He started showing signs of sort of the the marks on the back of his neck which you know when you pressed on them they they didn't disappear and his parents took the heartbreaking decision to switch off his life support machine it was cruel to keep him going there was no chance of him ever recovering so we had to just let him go the deadly disease strikes without warning and affects nine people in the uk every day children under five and students are most at risk but the disease can strike at any age the Grove family were devastated by Caden's death, but by sharing their experience, they hope it'll actually save lives. Natalie Gray, ITV News. Let's hope so. Mm. Well, time now to find out what's making the ITV News national headlines to London now and Alice Stewart. Engagement and anger reach fever pitch in the Scottish independence campaigns. With a massive turnout predicted, the Yes campaign claimed they can seize victory in the last two days. The pledge of more powers for Scotland's Parliament, whoever wins the general election, keeps hopes high on the no side. Also gone at last, but without apology, Rotherham's crime and police commissioner resigns. And as Thai police release video of a suspect in the killing of two British holidaymakers, moving tributes from the victims' families. Julie Etchingham's in Edinburgh and I'll be here at 6.30. Well, now, tonight we start our annual series looking at the best buildings here in the South, the homes you've always wanted to live in with luxuries most of us can only dream of. It's a brilliant series, it and is. they're all finalists in the Reba Awards, the Oscars of architecture. And this year there are some incredible buildings vying for a gong. Our first is a stunning home in Surrey, offering a family a lifestyle they'd only dreamed of. Stacey Poole has been for a tour. This house has it all, the perfect location, stunning views and every luxury you can imagine. We did want it to be a house of fun, so we've got lots of music playing all the time and um, we just seem to sh enjoy and share more experiences that mm. way, don't we? It's helped us bond as a family in many ways, hasn't mm. it? For Mark and Breege and their three children, this house has totally changed the way they live. The space, the views, the open plan styling is a world away from their previous cramped Victorian terrace. Never imagined that I would live in a, an open plan space with all of the views and everything else and, and it really has changed my whole perception of what living is like with three kids in a house um, which has got these views. We see a lot more of each other, it's much more sociable space as well. So yeah, it, it's actually it's more than I could have hoped for. But this light, airy space designed around family living didn't happen by accident. It took three years of rigorous research, planning and, of course, pioneering design. We thought about the way that the house works, where do you spend your daylight hours. So we'd flip the whole house around so that the living room is up on the top and then we put the bedrooms in underneath. So it was really the landscape and the slope that, that set out the form for the house. 
One of the features that really stands out is the amount of light in every single room. How have you managed to achieve that? Well, whilst we've got this main wall of glass which faces south and takes in the view, we've also introduced this structural glass curved ridge. So this helps to throw light in at the back. It is a lovely feature. Is it the first time you've used that? It is. It was, uh, it was an interesting learning curve for right. us um, because every single glass panel is different and had to be measured and made on site. The view is incredible. Did you design the house around that view? We did. The sense of arrival is fundamental when you arrive at the home. So we've created this two-storey hallway with a big picture window that creates a frame to the perfect ever-changing picture beyond. The most successful thing that I can see is that you've created a way of living that they didn't have before. Well, living today has changed from the days of Georgian and Victorian homes. Yeah. We very much aspire to an outside lifestyle. So to be able to create these external spaces, which on a day like today and with a view like this, are just absolutely sensational places to be. And along with the outside rooms, they also have an outside pool. But this is not just any pool. So it's a natural water swimming pool, no chemicals, and all of the filtration is done through the reeds at the side of the pool. So onto something that looked natural, blended into the landscape, and also not having any chemicals is, is a major mm. advantage. Mm. It's great, the kids use it every night after school. It's brilliant. The really lovely thing about this house is it's not a show home, it's a family home that's been designed around their every need and it's totally transformed their lives. It's inspirational. Do you pinch yourselves regularly and think, oh my God, this is actually ours? Yeah, e even after buying the land three years ago and going through the whole process, every day we do have to pinch ourselves and say, this is, this is real. We love it. Stacey Paul, ITV News. Very nice. And lovely to look around. Mm. Thank you for letting us do that. Well, tomorrow something entirely different. The Mary Rose Museum in Portsmouth. Now, it's a brand new building that's generating as much attention as the Tudor warship itself, creating a striking silhouette in Portsmouth Dockyard. And Fred and I know it very we know well. It very well yeah. indeed. We'll look forward to that tomorrow. Meanwhile, they are rarer than they once were, but messages in bottles do still wash up on our beaches. But in all his years scouring the coastline on the Isle of Wight, A.D. Butler had never come across one. That was until earlier this month when he found three all on the same beach and within minutes of each other. Well, we'll be chatting to A.D. in a minute, but first, here's Richard Jones. A.D. Butler has lived on the island all his life and has wandered along its beaches, first as a dog walker, then as a fossil hunter, and most recently as an organiser of cleanups. He's amazed by the amount of rubbish not just the litter, the cans and the discarded fishing gear, but also the personal possessions he finds. I call it lost property, which is things that weren't intended to be lost to the sea. You know, things like you quite often find people's shoes. The Isle of Wight's renowned for shoes. We've, we've probably picked up maybe two, two or three carrier bags of shoes so far. He and other volunteers have removed 200 bin bags of rubbish from island beaches so far this year. None of it was of much interest. Then A.D. stumbled across real treasure for any beachcomber. Not just one message in a bottle, but three. I was amazed when I found the one, and especially, especially it's in a glass bottle that didn't break. It was in a nice old style bottle. The letter was tied up. It was almost perfect. It's, it's, it's kind of like the perfect message in a bottle. Um, five minutes along the beach to find a second one was just, was just made me laugh, made me chuckle. It was a bit smaller, it was a bit more, it wasn't quite as glamorous as the first one. But then another 10 minutes along the beach to find a third one with a boat in it, a ship in a bottle. What can I say? It's, it's, it's probably a once in a lifetime find, I guess. AD took the bottles and the messages home and incredibly he managed to resist the temptation to open them. Until now. Richard Jones, ITV News on the Isle of Wight. Yes, until now. AD is with us. These are the bottles, AD. Yep. This is so exciting, isn't it? This is them. This is them. Television this is first. As it gets. <laughs> this was the first one, and it's, you can see the little bit of paper there. It's sent from someone called Marcel Villiger in Switzerland, so he must have dropped it in the sea somewhere. Can we open this one? Yeah, let's, let's get on and, and see what's inside. Then. OK. See what's uh, said. 
How exciting. You've no idea. You honestly have. Well, you clearly haven't been inside no. this one before. It's still got water in it. I notice. Ooh. Yeah, this one wasn't wasn't watertight, unfortunately. It wasn't watertight. But watertight. I think they've they've made preparations yes, for that. Water in it. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Out it comes. Sangeeta, would you like to? I would like to do the honours. I don't know what it's and wrapped while you're in. You're doing that one. It's very. In Let's fact, it's very soggy, open. so I'm Maybe. not going to attempt it. But I can tell you that I can make out some writing, which looks like it's German. Oh, it's German. It is yeah. indeed. And we're not very good at German. No, I just don't want to ruin what it says. Well, there's a lot of German there, and we'll have to there get and we'll have to get that one. There it. Oh, 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 see, oh. It's very fragile. It's very fragile. There we very are. Fragile. What have you got? In the, this what, is all. In the it's a one? long, long letter. This from a gentleman in Switzerland. Can you see that? I want you today, next week, next month, next year, for the rest of my life. He wants you. Amazing. It's a, <laughs> it's a love letter then. <laughs> How are you getting on with this one? This one's proven problematic. OK. Um, we may need to... But that uh, one we know comes from Dave from Sandbanks. So you, you get the third one open. Right, and okay. I'll try and get this one out. With your tweezer. <laughs> with your tweezer. <laughs> may have to try and twist. It may need some oh. uh, gentle This one does look that. a bit more watertight, doesn't it? It's still damp, unfortunately. Still damp. Yeah. Oh. Right. Oh, this there you go. One of the... Go for it, go for it. What's that one go say? Um, no idea yet. There's, there's another message in this bottle. I don't know what this piece is, so... This okay. one is determined not to come out. This one's not. No, all you can see this is, is Dave from, from Sandbanks. Sand Sand there's two beads in it. Oh, are there? Yeah, there's two kind of... Oh, here we go. What's that one? See information there that someone's posted about messages in a bottle and a, and a, a picture of the Queen Mary too there, which I guess ah. this may be a little uh, representation and of this the one, model of. This one appears to come from Germany. It is. It's from somewhere called Berg in Germany. Brilliant. All about message in a bottle. It's telling you how to do it. And it's all from Hans, who's telling you that he's travelling and arriving from Hamburg to New York. So he's on the way to New York. So Brilliant. Andy, Excellent. So briefly, what are you going to do with these now? Um, I think we'll probably try and collect up any, any more messages that we find and, and indeed any other messages that people want to donate. And we're going to put them... Uh, I'm going to donate them to Shore Archive which is uh, uh, a lady on the island that's doing awareness of plastic pollution. Um, and she displays her works of art and things around public places for people to see. So I think people might like to have a look for themselves. And if Dave from Sandbanks is watching, I can't open it, Dave, <laughs> without destroying it anymore. Please let us know what's in that bottle. Sangeeta, there's something you wanted to say. Message in a bottle. Every time I think about this story, Aidy, thank you so much <laughs> thank for you. coming Thank you. Cheers. In. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You said you'd sing with me. <laughs> I <laughs> was coated, but I couldn't match your lovely dulcet tones. No one tones. can, you're Fred. A, you're a modern day Thank Vera you. Lynn. Thank you so much. Now, <laughs> if, like Aidy, you discover any messages in bottles, we'd be ple pleased to hear from you. While we're on the subject, according to the Guinness Book of Records, the oldest message in a bottle ever found was discovered off Shetland two years ago, 98 years after a scientist threw it into the sea to measure ocean currents around Scotland. Fantastic. And I'm pleased to say that Simon joins us now with your weather. Yes, well, not the weather just yet. Some other interesting finds from across Hopefully the region. Hopefully weather-related. Well, it, probably not, <laughs> but uh, okay. they're out there because the weather's nice. Put it that way. But uh, have a look at this first picture. Isn't that cute? Look, oh. a little oh. fella that turns up in Donna's garden in Lugashaw. Uh, apparently comes out when she whistles. Won't stay cute for long, though, because, look, he's a baby rat. Oh. Uh, meanwhile, Lawrence and Anne Holloway were at Burton Pond near Petworth and they came across a British mammal they've never seen before, a harvest mouse. Oh. Isn't it? Uh, very tame. Lawrence says one after. It in my open hand, it simply climbed aboard. Look. Oh, no. uh, meanwhile, Shane Stanbridge has found not one but two harvest mice at the same time. Good no, unbelievable. Great. Uh, Anne Marie Plews, you might want to look away, Sangers, uh, has been pleased to see so many baby lizards out and about <laughs> at the minute. I think there are at least five on this photo. And very quickly, have a look at this. Can you see what's been nesting in Dawn Gray's roof? Can you tell what that is? No. is it a bat? It's a bat. It yeah. is. She's yeah, never it is. pictured them before, but managed to get a couple of photos after years. Isn't that amazing? Someone who's completely batty <laughs> with your weather forecast, for Simon Perky <laughs> Parkin. That's us driving on, mm -hmm. us driving off in France, mm. and us on the bridge. Oh. Driving to Europe, Eurotunnel Le Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. Now, can you guess from the subtle clue from Clinton's picture 
what tomorrow morning might look like. Yep, probably a bit grey again. That's the pattern for this week. It's all to do with the high and the low pressure, the mist and the low cloud blowing in on an easterly breeze. But you can see down to the south, we've got low pressure working its way further northwards. And as the week goes on, there is a, a bigger chance of us seeing some showers. And watch out, some of them could be on the sharp side. Few showers around today, but drying out this evening. A lot of dry weather overnight. And, well, it will be mild again, 14, 15 the low. Clear skies to begin with, but after midnight, we'll see the cloud and the mist and the fog roll back in from the east. And so, yes, it will be another murky start to tomorrow. But the murk will lift, the cloud will thin and break. And again, we'll get some good sunny spells on the go come the afternoon. Not wall-to-wall -wall sunshine, bit of cloud around, but temperatures in that sunshine, 23, 24 again, which is 75 in Fahrenheit. Though a bit of a breeze developing along the coast. High tide times tomorrow you can see in Brighton, quarter to six in the morning, quarter past six in the evening. And then watch out for a few showers by Friday. Ah, oh. Eurotunnel the shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. And in just a moment here on ITV, we have the national and international news with Alistair Stewart and Julie Etchingham in Edinburgh. Join me if you can for our late news. But for now, from the team here at ITV Meridian, thank you very much indeed for watching. Take good care of yourselves. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>